Three minutes after, that's when I start my meetings. My name, Kerry Rogers, Director of Staff Engineering, Riverbed Tech Support. Um, I came up through TAC, answering phones, helping customers solve problems, looking at packets. Uh, joined the, got promoted to Staff Engineering, which is backline support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now I, I manage the team. Um, I was here yesterday, Mon Mon Tuesday, doing some case studies with Wireshark. Today is a little different. I've never presented this before. Um, this is something that I actually did at a previous job, ooh, let's just say more than 10 years ago. Um, I think it's pretty cool. I hope you do too. There's a lot of different elements and skills that come into play. Uh, but before we get into it, I feel like for my own safety and security, I need to um, show you a disclaimer. I apologize about having to disguise my appearance. When I release this information to the world, I do not want to be found by the authorities. What are you doing? I thought you were down here to take out the garbage. Yeah, I just got, I had to thing with the... Ha 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 ha! That was funny. Um, yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about the, that part of it in a second. Um, let me explain to you how this came about. I used to work at a university um, as like their Unix, Linux, network admin. Um, we didn't have firewalls. We used extensive ACLs for security. Um, you know, and universities tend to be more open, so, um, but, but as things progressed and more and more devices were on the network, they started to care more and more, more and more about security, but they didn't want to invest because it was a state institution. We don't have money for that. Um, so we just continued to build these crazy long ACLs. When you put in a ticket, we need access to this printer. OK, well, I've got to put in a new line in the ACL for your VLAN, apply it to the interface, move on. It got to the point where I think we were cutting and pasting these really long ACLs, and the router would go, Hoo! And like everyone would go, oh, did the network go down? Because everything would freeze, you know? And I think we changed how we did it with a script and maybe got more fancy. But it wasn't actually, I mean, for most purposes, it, it was fine. But it wasn't really secure. So I wanted to come up with like a proof of concept to show to my boss um, that, you know what, if someone wants to get around this, they, they could uh, in, in a very specific use case. Again, this is university. So lots of students have computers in their dorm room, uh, like a you know, desktop with files, a server, then they go to, they take a laptop to the, the class, and maybe they want to connect back to their, their dorm room for something. Well, they can't, because the dorm VLAN has got an ACL, and you can't connect into it. Uh, so this is the use case uh, where you can, again, you, you have your laptop, you have your, your server, that's, that's behind an ACL, and you can, you can connect to it and you know pull files off or do whatever you want to do. Uh, that was a note to myself to do that. So the objective for us today is to demonstrate how we can connect to a web server that's, that is protected behind a router ACL. Uh, the caveat here is that you do own the server. It's not like your, so there are some, some modifications that you do to the server. So it is a specific use case. Um, I don't, you know, this is sort of, there's a lot of demo involved here. Yesterday on the train back, I, I'm commuting back and forth to San Francisco, from San Francisco. I set this up all in a virtual environment um, last week, and then I was just double checking, make sure everything was cool on my train ride home, and everything was broken. Um, I spent the entire train ride pulling my hair out, trying to make it work again, um, and that's why I have wireless turned off. So far, so good. So um, I don't know how long this is going to take. It might take 30 minutes and we're done. We'll talk about some other stuff, um, whatever you want. Talk about movies, packets, uh, your favorite 
restaurant recommendations, or you can, you can go, but we'll see. Or it could take the whole time if, depending how smooth it goes. Is this hacking? Like, am I a hardcore elite, whatever the word is? No, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not a security guy. This was just, I thought it was, I thought it was cool and fun to do. Maybe you will too, I don't know. Um, when I did it, and I showed it to my boss, you're like, okay, yeah, all right, fine. Um, and then I would tell like, some of my friends about it, and they're like, you, what, you did packets and flags and TCP? Uh, you know, or even if they were technical, they didn't really get it. It wasn't until, I don't know, a couple years later, I went to like a SANS class, uh, I think like Mike Poor SANS class, and I was like, hey, by, you know, on a break, I was like, I wanna tell you about this thing I did. And he, like, oh, that's really cool. I was like, oh, well, thank you, finally. Someone who appreciates. Um, so here's some things that, you're, that come into play for this little, um, this little session. So I put like a three fin mark for like advanced, but it's not, you'll be able to grasp everything we're talking about. It's not that it's like so deep or hard. It's just that there's a lot of different skills. There's, there's packets, TCP, and routers, and ACLs, and host firewalls, and divert sockets, which we're gonna, I guess these are the things that I'm listing here. Um, you know, probably, maybe, possibly, you've heard someone mention the TCP handshake this week, I don't know, but we're going to talk about that. The TCP header flags that go along with it, host firewalls that, you know, uh, allow traffic in and out of an actual host machine, the divert sockets, which we will cover what that is, and you need to have a little bit of programming or scripting experience, Python, Perl, C, something like that to make this work and be familiar with a, a Cisco ACL, like how to create one, how to put it on an interface for the router, um, and the established keyword. This is key. So the ACL, let's just say a very simple one might look like this. So access list, permit, ICMP, any, any. So you apply this to an interface and it's going to allow ICMP in and out or, I'm sorry, in whichever direction you apply the, 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 um, <clears throat> this ACL. It will allow ICMP from any host to any host in your local network. Permit, TCP, any, any, established. Again, there's that keyword, established. We're gonna dive into that. And then, deny anything else TCP related. So this is a very simple ACL. Um, established. What does that mean? You think uh, a TCP connection as established, what does that generally mean? Yeah, sin, sin, ack, ack, you know, you've, you've done the, the, the handshake, how are you, now let's talk. So that's what we generally think of, but like what does that actually mean in terms of this keyword for an ACL? It just means if only the sin flag is set, I'm gonna drop this packet, because again, it's not, an ACL is not stateful. It doesn't understand that, okay, we've, I've seen you, I've seen you, we've done that. Okay, now we have established and I've got a rule. We're just matching, we're just checking packets, right? So let me check the packet. Does it have a send flag? If it does, only send flag, drop it. Otherwise, let it in, right? Maybe. We'll see. Um, so just for this setup, Maybe I can show it to you real quick. So this is a setup we're gonna use. So you apply an ACL either in or out on an interface, right? So we're talking about this one at the top on R1, 10, 1, 10, 101. That's the interface we're gonna apply the, the ACL on the out, right? So anything from the interface, interface perspective out into the network, that's where we're, mat we're running the ACL against that traffic. So if I say permit TCP any, any established, then packets coming in that are going out to the local network, the local segment, that's where I'm checking if there's a send flag or not. I'm gonna drop it. So connections coming from the outside trying to get into this local segment will be dropped if they just have a send flag. That's all, you guys probably, you know all that stuff. But if there's any questions along the way, speak up, shout them out. 
So we mentioned send flag, TCP. This here is a TCP header. It's a little dated. It's just the one I, I had on hand. But you know, you get the idea. So you guys have been looking at packets probably all week in, in uh, Wireshark. Expand the, the, the TCP header. You're going to see these things, da, 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 right? Source port, destination port, sequence numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And you get over here, and you've got these little flags right here. And these are bits, individual bits that are set. Zero or one if the flag is set. And we over here, in the one position, we have fin. In the two position, we have sin. So if the TCP flags are set to essentially two, the decimal two, that means only that one's set, because you one, two, four, eight, and so on, then we want to match that one, and we want to drop it. That's what the established keyword does. So how can we test this out, make sure we understand how it really functions? We want to be able to maybe craft some packets and send them up against the, the firewall, right? I mean, the, the router, and see what happens. So there's something called HPing, which lets you essentially um, craft a packet and send it to a remote host. So we're going to use that to test the functionality. And so again, I'm going to be on this client machine. No, I lied. I'm going to be on my Mac, because that's where I have HPing installed. And I'm going to ping FreeBSD 1, 10, 1, 10, 100, going through the router. Hopefully, all that connectivity is still there. OK. Can you see that OK? Oh, it got smaller. Let me make it bigger. That. OK, over here, this one is the server that we're pinging. So we're going to run TCP dump. That's it. We're going to filter out port 22 because I'm SSH'd into it. Otherwise, we'll get a bunch of junk. So we're going to get a few little things here and there. But for the most part, um, just keep an eye on that. Over here, again, on my Mac, if you can see, I'm going to run HPing. I'm going to set the send flag. Everyone see that OK? Should it be bigger or OK? All right, and I'm going to ping that host. And you have to be root to run it. OK, nothing on the right, and we're getting ICMP packet filtered from the router, right? That's what we expect to happen. Let's add an ACK flag. So now we're just flipping the bit on the ACK flag. Whoops, let me clear this out a little bit. Whoops. Oh, there it goes. So now it's getting through, right? Because from the host on the inside, if I'm initiating a connection out, I'm sending a packet with a send flag set. But that's on the in direction of the interface, right? The in direction, so the ACL doesn't apply. I connect to a web server, whatever it is. I need the send act to be able to come back to me, right? Otherwise, I can't establish a connection. And again, this guy's not stateful, so he doesn't understand, oh, I saw the send already, so I can let it back in. He's just saying, if the send and the act are set, this is the established keyword, its behavior. It's going to go ahead and let it through. Let's try some other things. Uh, how about probably just the ACK? What do you think, yes or no? Yeah? Yep, so there are the replies. And by replies here, what happens if, if you're TCP and you get a packet on a port that you're not, you don't have established connection or you're not listening on, what are you going to do with that? Send a reset, right? I mean, you can see flags are. You're getting, the, you're getting the packet in, and it's like, I don't know what this is. I'm not listening on this port. Or even if I am, it's not a send packet. It's not 
part of an established connection, reset this, get it out of here. Um, how about this one? How about just uh, a reset? Let's try that. Yep. Reset begets a reset. And how about lastly, a fin? We expect a, a fin to get through, yes or no? But based on what we know, that seems reasonable. Whoa! Pfft. Fins don't get through. Don't know why, but that's the way it behaves. So, now I think we've pretty clearly established the behavior of the <laughs> established keyword. So, let's continue on. Yeah, this is gonna go pretty quick. <laughs> That's good. So, HPing, we did. So, all right, now we've established what's gonna happen if we try to connect to a web server on that free BSD box. It's not gonna get through. So how are we going to get around this? What's the mechanism by which we do this thing? Divert sockets. Yay. Okay, so divert sockets. Let me explain to you what those are with this handy little animation that I'll talk to as it goes. So when you have an application that wants to talk to another application, a web browser wants to talk to a web server, it's going to go down to TCP and say, hey TCP, can you please go talk to that other uh, TCP for me to establish a connection? What does TCP do? It makes a send packet, it goes down through the host firewall, goes out on the wire, comes back through the other firewall to the TCP to establish the, start the establishment of the, of the connection. Um, so that TCP is gonna talk to that TCP so that the applications can talk to each other. But the problem is these host firewalls are what we're gonna do is use the host firewalls in a divert socket. It's a rule that will redirect or divert, if you will, traffic to a little program running off to the side. So when the SIN comes in, you can divert it, make a change to it, then send it out on the wire, and when it comes back in the other side, you have another rule matching to divert it to your little program, which will flip it back, and voila, right? That's the idea. So this is just, yeah. So this rule, the host firewall, whatever it is, um, FreeBSD has IPFW, so that's what I'm using. So it supports divert sockets. Not everything does. Uh, when I first did this many years ago, I did it with a Mac as the client and BSD as the server. The Mac also used IPFW, easy peasy. Well, the Mac that I have now uses PF, which I think is from OpenBSD originally. Also, I'm sorry? Yes. Cool, I got that right. Um, which also recently, eh, recently supports divert sockets. I said, great, I just have to learn the new syntax of the command to put into the firewall to redirect my packet. And I, I, for about a half a day, I tried to make it work just to find out the Mac version of PF doesn't support divert sockets. So uh, Linux and IP tables, I also believe does divert sockets. I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. So however your host firewall can do it, you need to have a rule to say, okay, this traffic, whatever this, this traffic is, matches a rule, I'm going to send it out to a little program, do whatever you want to with it, and then the program writes it back, and then it sends it on its way. And then you do the opposite on the other side. We are clear so far, yeah? 
So divert sockets, right? Um, this is something that you run a script, a program. It binds to a local port on the machine. I think I'm using 45678. And it runs in user space, which I think kernels do not. So switching between, context switching between, you know, kernel space and user space is kind of expensive. So you need to keep that in mind. It can be a big performance hit depending on, I guess, what you're trying to do. Uh, this is a pretty simple one. So they're redirected from the host firewall to this program. Now, if you don't have anything listening on that local port, my 45678 port, if I don't start the program or it dies for whatever reason, the packets just get dropped. So we are at the scripts that I wrote for this. And I used to be a Perl guy. Now I'm a Salesforce guy? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't really do that. But so the Perl script on the client side, um, when it's coming down, we're looking for the send flag, right? And we're going to switch that, in this case, to a reset ACK. And then we're going to send it on its way. On the server side, it's almost the exact same script. Flip a couple of lines, check for a reset ACK, change it to a send, send it on its way. Let's have a look at the script. It's, uh, scripts. All right. So this is the client side. You see that OK? Yeah? All right. So you may be pro guys. You may not be. You may not have any scripting. That's fine. We're just going to kind of walk through and talk about what this is doing. So it, it does use a module called net divert to make the magic happen. And then I'm using a couple of modules called net packet to be able to take the packet apart and put it back together. So I'm creating this divert object, and I am binding it to localhost on 45678. And then this is the routine that gets called for every packet that gets redirected from the firewall to my script. It calls this subroutine. So we get the packet. And the first thing we're going to do is decode the IP header. So it, Again, these, these modules have really done all the heavy lifting for you. Uh, you call IP decode on your packet, and it gives you back an IP object, right? So now, in the IP object, we can go to the next layer. So if the protocol in the IP header is TCP, we'll continue. If not, we don't, we don't want it. Now we're going to strip off the, uh, or we're going to decode the TCP part. So we're going to call a TCP decode on the IP object's data, right? So we have the IP header, and then the IP data is TCP, right? So that gives us a TCP object. And now the fun can begin. So we're checking the TCP object, its flags. Are they equal to SIN and SIN only, right? That is decimal 2. And I'm just going to print a little, a little statement that says, hey, found a send flag. I'm going to change it to reset ACK. So we are changing the flags here to a reset ACK. We're ORing the reset and ACK together. And then we're going to take the uh, TCP that we have, this TCP object we have. We're going to encode it back to the uh, IP, and then we're going to take the IP that now has the new TCP glued onto it, and we're going to encode that whole thing back into a packet. And once we've done that, all we have to do is write it back out, put packet. And so if this, was, if this wasn't TCP, we just skip right down and just pa basically pass it through and write the, the packet back out. The server side is pretty much the same, so we won't go through all of it. We'll just highlight the differences. So same module, same stuff, same getting the packet, stripping off, getting the IP header, getting the TCP data, making sure it's TCP. And then we're just reversing 
the little trick, right? We're checking for if the flags are equal to reset ACK, we'll have a print little statement that we're flipping it, and we'll set the flags to sin. Re-encode the object, put it all back together, write it back out. Yeah? That is the magic piece that will allow us to do this thing. Uh, I think we're ready to move forward. Yeah, hopefully we'll do it. That was supposed to come up after we did it. <laughs> okay, so um, what we'll do is first let's start a capture. I'm going to start it on this. End. So again, we're, now we're on the, this BSD client down here. And we're going to just tell net right, to port 80 of this guy up here. And I'm going to start a capture here. There's going to be probably some junk in here. We'll just kind of ignore that. That, this, this, and this is another um, shell on the client side. So we're going to tell net to 10.1.10.100 on port 80. Right? Right. Unable to connect to remote host. That's what we expect, right? That's what we expect. So let's stop this capture. Here's the send packet from my client to the web server, SYN on port 80, destination unreachable, communication administratively filtered. And just so you can see, where is this? This is the router. So we just have the two interfaces, right? This is the one facing the server. And so we have an IP access group 101 out to the segment. And again, pretty much the exact same one I showed you, but I did add, SS I want to allow SSH so I can SSH into the, into the host. So very simple, just TCP, any, any established, deny all other TCP. Okay. Ooh, no. So now we need to insert the firewall rule to divert the traffic to our script. And I did that already earlier, so I'll just go to it. OK, IPFW, again, is the firewall on this host. So we're going to add a rule, give it some integer, 190, divert to local port 45678 TCP from any to the web server's IP on port 80 in the out direction. So this is going to get packets going from my client to this web server and redirect them through this divert socket, through my script. Right? There it is at the top. Otherwise, we allow IP any any. On the server side, we've got to flip it and catch it coming in. Add a rule, 190, divert, same port, 45678, TCP, from any to any. I mean, I could, obviously, if I were doing this for real, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is no such thing, I would, I, would, I would have this just for the client machine, because I don't want to redirect all port 80 traffic through my divert socket. But for simplicity's sake, that's what I'm going to do. In the in direction, coming into the host. Divert, there it is. OK, so now if we try to connect, I will, it will still not work. Right, right, because we don't have the script running. Got to have the script running. If I did it now, it, the, the packet would get dropped on the local machine because I've put the divert rule in, but I haven't ran the script. Divert client. Okay, now 
on the server. Divert server. So now I believe we have all the pieces in place. Our ACL is in place. It's been denying stuff like a champ. We have divert rules on both sides. And we have the scripts running on both sides. Let's start the capture this time. And let's go back to the client. Not that one. You go away. So if we tell net to port 80, we should see both scripts spit out what they're doing, and we should get connected, right? I mean, that's the hope. That's some really, ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> so, and you can do git. Uh, it's, it's better if you can do it visually, but uh, there's no web browser on here. Git, look, there's a web page. So, up here, sin was sent, flipped to sin ack, sent out on the wire. When it came in off the wire, we saw the reset ack, flipped it to sin, gave it to TCP. If we look at the PCAP, do, do, we see a reset ack, right? Because we're, we're capturing this here. The magic was done down here, so we have a reset act going out into the router. We see a reset act that makes it right, it sails right through the ACL, no problem. Comes to this host. The script does its magic, and it sends out, uh, it sends out a Synac. That looks crazy, right? You've probably never seen a three-way handshake look like this, I'm going to guess. Um, and then you have the ACK come back. So we have reset ACK for our covert SYN, SYN ACK, ACK, and then we have the rest of it, the GET, reply, and it's all fine. So there we go. We did it. That took 35 minutes. We have, first, questions about this. Um, again, well, let me ask you what, yeah, go ahead, questions. Any questions about this? I mean, I think it's straightforward, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Yeah. No, that. No, I got you. No, I have a. Um, if he if he were to hit the <laughs> the web server, it brings up a, a picture and it's like ta-da. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but I like I said the, the the Mac firewall changed on me, so I had to use that, and I didn't think to redirect it through. That's a good point. If I do this again, I'll I will do that. Um, what other uses can you think of for a divert socket where you can, on your host, touch the traffic, look at the traffic? Because you can do whatever you want. You can, any ideas that come to mind? Natting. Right. NAT, there you go. Statistics, if you wanted, on your host. Um, looking at. I think, sorry, I won't think, but you convert this in, do you expect it to send it somewhere else? So, what I did here. Yeah, yeah. It's. Send goes down, redirects, gets set to a reset act, and then redirect it again back to a send. So it just flips it on right before it goes out the wire, then flips it back before it gets to TCP. And no one was the wiser, except unless you're looking at Wireshark. What's that? Yeah. Payload. 
Oh, I see. You could hide payload. Yeah, you could. I mean, yeah. So if you have the, the idea and the skill set, you can modify the packet however you want. And TCP application would never know. Um, so you'd certainly uh, covert sending covert because yeah, that's right. Your script could put in something covert. When it received received on the other side, you strip it out, save it, whatever, and send the the original packet on, and no one would know. Hmm, I'll keep my eye on you. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? Was that was that was that kind of cool? Say again, louder. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, we have got still like, what, 30 minutes? Um, we can look at packets if you want. Yeah. This thing? This is a GNS3. Yeah. So um, yeah, so we've got 30 minutes. I'd be happy to, you guys want to look at some packets, like a, a case study or something that I didn't do earlier today? Or if you want to leave, you can leave. Um, look at packets. All right, did anyone see me last year? Last year at this, you did? Anyone else? You did. OK, then I'll do one from last year if you guys might be bored. Like I said, I had no idea how long this would, uh, would take to go through, considering the troubles that I've had or whatnot. Uh, let's see. Packet bomb, shark fest. What did I? Oh wait, no, they're up there. Okay. Okay, we'll do this one. This is a FTP upload. Um, the situation here is. Let me just open it. They had uh, a firewall. I believe it was a, it was a um, yeah, it was a 40 gate firewall. And they replaced it with a checkpoint. OK. After that, the video team that uploads videos to London from somewhere uh, say, hey, this is all of a sudden really slow. We were getting maybe 20 megabits a second. Now we're getting five. What changed? Like, oh, we didn't change anything. Like, well, you know, <laughs> you change the firewall. But like, why would a firewall, you know, maybe impact performance? So this is a PCAP from the new checkpoint. So let's try to understand why this is slow. Um, OK, we've got all my stuff here. Make it a little bigger. That's big. OK, so. I get sent this PCAP from someone who emails it to me. Uh, he's, he, he told me what I just told you. Let's see what I'm dealing with. You going to look at conversations? There's one. Fantastic. I know exactly what, there's only one thing to look at, this one connection. Thank goodness we have a three-way handshake. So we can see what's going on there. We've got MSS, we've got a small window scale in SAC. And on the other end, MSS, SAC, slightly bigger window scale. Uh, what's the round trip time? 23 milliseconds. 23 milliseconds, that is correct. Uh, we've captured this on the client side or the server side? Towards the client, right. We know that for where the delay is, right? 
At time zero, the client sends the SIN packet out. It travels across the WAN. The server receives it. The SIN act comes back from the server. That's one full round trip between the SIN and the SIN act. If it was between the SIN act and the act, we know it was captured closer to the server. OK, so we can scroll down, see if we see. We can look at the nice little handy um, magic scroll bar and see there's a very regular some kind of pattern, depending on you know, my coloring rules. You wouldn't see that necessarily. My coloring rules have a nice little blue, blue for push bits. I like to know where the push bits are. But you can see there's definitely a regular pattern, right? So the tool that I reach for first when I'm looking at throughput, and this is FTP, is under statistics, time sequence graphs, TCP trace. And all we're looking at here is bytes sent over time. This, the y-axis is sequence number, which is just bytes, right? It's just um, sequence numbers represent the bytes being sent, the flow, of infer the flow of data so we know where we are in the flow. And then we have time in seconds. So bytes over seconds, that's just throughput, right? We want to see this line go up and to the right, which it's doing. And we can zoom in and have a closer look. These little guys are the packets. The longer they are, the more data is sent per packet. So we send two, and then we send four, and then we send eight. What does that sound like? Slow start. Great. The line below it are the acknowledgments, right? So if we s s can see that the last packet we sent is here. When we move across and at the same level that this, the bottom line, bottom line comes up to that height, that means all that data has now been acknowledged. And it took from here to here to do it. So that's a round trip. So then we send more data. We wait a round trip, and the acknowledgments come in, and all the data has been acknowledged. The line above it is the receive window of the receiver. So the space between the packets and that line, that's how much space is in the receive buffer of the client. And it, you can see that it is going, uh, maintaining that space. And actually, if you saw Simon's TCP talk yesterday, um, it's actually going on right now as well, you can clearly see that space is growing. So it is auto whatevering and increasing the size of the SIN buffer as the connection goes on. So there's plenty of space in the receive buffer, right? We're not coming anywhere near it except way down here at the very beginning, but it started growing, and we didn't grow with it. These little packet trains, they're the same every time. Every time, right? We're sending packets go out, we wait a round trip, Acknowledgements come in. We send more data over and over again. So you can clearly see this pattern being played out in this graph. And if you click on any packet, it'll take you there in the packet view. We can switch over. And let's, let's really look and see what's happening. So here we have the beginning of a packet train. We, the reason why we know that is because it's sending 1460 bytes for its TCP payload, and the bytes in flight with that matches it at 1460. That means that prior to this, all the outstanding data had been acknowledged. So we can see the bytes in flight are increasing by multiples of 1460. And then we get here, and there's that blue line. And that's what? Push bit, right? What's special about this? What jumps out at you? What's that? Packet is not maximum size. That's right. That's right, it's not. What else jumps out at you about where this, so this is an indicator, right? This push bit, and then this, this packet that has less than the maximum size. Is that an 8K bar? 
exactly 8K mark. We go more packets and we hit what? 16K push bit. So we've got, and then we stop. And the acknowledgments come in after 23 milliseconds, round trip. And then we start over. Now we've acknowledged all the outstanding data. We're going to start over again with bytes in flight 1460, push bit 8K, push bit 16K, and we wait over and over and over. So what this tells me is that the application, the FTP application that's sending the data, is writing 8K or 16K chunks, and that's all it will do. And it waits for, the, for all that to be acknowledged, then it will send another chunk and another chunk. But it never sends more than that. So it doesn't matter. You, know, you have a receive window that has plenty of space. You know, we don't have packet loss, so the congestion window may be growing. But you're still bound by this send buffer size. So this is a, a buffer. You have a receive buffer that's visible, essentially. That's what the, res the window size is. But you also have a send buffer on the sending side that's not really visible, but these push bits are clues about what the size might be. So we're never going to fill this pipe. Right? We're, we're limited by this small sin buffer. So I went back to the guy and I said, look, th this is clearly the problem. I've seen this a hundred times. Um, people send me iPerf PCAPs all the time and they're like, oh, we're not getting the throughput. I did an iPerf test. What's wrong? It's like, well, it's not, you may have a circuit problem or you may have a problem, but it's all overshadowed by using this small window with iPerf and it just doesn't fill the pipe. It doesn't try. It stops. Um, so this kind of behavior I've seen many times. They said, well, OK, no, that makes sense. But why, why did it work before? Why would changing the firewall cause, a pro cause this problem? I said, OK, well, you don't happen to have a PCAP from the previous firewall. Like, well, we actually have been setting it up in the lab to do some testing to see, well, what's different about this firewall? So. We have that one as well. Um, I'll show you this one first. So this is the LAN uh, side of the firewall. And right away, you see oh, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of black packets, uh, black and red. And that's ooh, what's going on. Sin, Sinac. Then we have this um, two more Sinacs out of order. But if you look close, you can see, well, they're the same port, right? 55, 913. And it seems like, here's the next set. Here's an AC, and then two more dupe ACs. Now, because I knew this came from a firewall, and I've seen this behavior with firewalls, I figured probably not really dupe ACs and out of order. But let me check. So I click on the first one, and I go to the internet uh, the Internet Protocol version 4 header. Um, and I look at the IP ID, 9604. And I click on the first dupack. Well, it's 9604. And the next one is 9604. Um, so these are duplicate packets. They get captured at different points in the, when you take a, a, a PCAP on this particular firewall, you get m duplicate packets. The quickest way. Well, the easiest way to do it is use edit cap. It comes with Wireshark. Edit cap minus D. Give it the file name and the new file name. It uh, almost always works for me. So this is the D dupe. Oh, that's much better, right? No more duplicate packets. Conversations. One connection. Great. Send. Do look pretty much the same? Yeah. Synac, pretty much the same. Windows scale one. Eh, is that a problem? I don't know. We'll see. What's, but what, el what, is, what else is different about this handshake? If you have heard me talk, you know I have a little checklist that I sometimes abide by. Um, and I like to check another thing when I'm looking at the, the handshake. We talked about it. In the, 
than the other cap? Round trip time, what's different? The other one was like 20 something milliseconds, right? So, huh, that's a, that's a clue. And we still see this, this behavior, right? This 8K, 16K behavior, right? So let's have a look at the graph. Yeah, it, it, it ramps up quite a bit. I mean, there's definitely some gaps in here, maybe some, some gaps, but for the most part, we don't see that. You can see, like, here's that little packet train, and then here's the next packet train, and here's the next packet train. Of course, something else happens here. But these packet trains are way closer together, right? Because before, we have to wait a round trip time. It was 23 milliseconds. We're sending 16K per 23 milliseconds. Here, a round trip time is in the, what, microseconds? 55 microseconds? So now we're sending it 16K per 55 microseconds. Do you think that's going to make a difference? I think so. So to me, this is OK. We've, we've got a local proxy, right? And he also gave me the, um, the WAN cap. Oh, look. Again, this is a slightly different location where they set, reset up the firewall, so it's not 23, but it's about 17 milliseconds. This is the WAN side. Huh. And do we see this 16K behavior over here? No. Look at the bytes in flight. That's this, that's this row here. It's going up and up and up. If we look at uh, the, the graph for this one, That looks very, very textbook TCP to me. Slow start, right? Just one little packet, two little packet, and so on. Increasing the congestion window. The congestion window meaning how many packets am I allowed to send? How many do I think I can send? I send those. I get the ax back. Well, I increase it. And during slow start, you know, it's an exponential increase. We're going up, and then, whoop, well, we're done. We finished the file. So this, I think if you, this comes up in some of these talks about, like, moving a server, moving an application to the cloud. Like, oh, we'll save money. It'll be great. But you're going maybe from low latency to the internet, longer latency. And some applications have bad behavior that is masked over by low latency. So 16K per round trip is bad behavior for most things, most connections. But when you're talking about microseconds, well, you know, you don't, you don't see the pain. Move that out across a WAN, and you're going to feel the pain pretty acutely, as they're doing here. I mean, from 20 megabits a second to 5 megabits a second. And then on, so we're, we're taking the data fast, acting it really fast, and then you've got a much more robust TCP, well, not the TCP, but the sending behavior of the TCP on the firewall itself is getting much better throughput. And actually, there's something you could do that would make it even better, because again, we spent you know, the first while here just sending like, a couple, pa one packet, two packet, four packet, a little bit. It's, it's, it takes time to ramp up, right? So the initial congestion window here is very low. So if your initial congestion window is higher, you're going to ramp up much quicker. Uh, and I, again, some talks about TCP. The more recent operating systems have moved from one to four to like 10 as an initial congestion window. All right, any questions about that? I'll do one more quick one. Um, I think this is it.
So this was, um, this was posted on Reddit in uh, the, the networking group, uh, subreddit. And the guy was like, um, hey, can someone help me troubleshoot this thing? We've got these brand new Dell servers in Iraq with a one gig switch. Um, and we're just doing some testing, you know. And the throughput is not great. But specifically, there's like a six, seven second delay at the beginning of the transfer where it just pauses, and then it goes on, and you know, it's better, but we're trying to, we, we've, we've replaced cables, we've done, you know, the things that people do. They go down this list of swapping things out and rebooting and say, can anyone help me? We, I've been trying to solve this for a month. So, well, can you post a PCAP? And here it is. And it took, I don't know, two minutes to spot it, because one, I've seen it before, but even if I hadn't, you'd be able to figure it out after a little bit of time. So again, we get the, uh, see what we're looking at here. Oh, there's several things in here now. Um, it's not quite so clean. So I, he said it's a throughput test. So I'm going to sort by bytes. All right, there's probably my contender, right, by, you know, a lot. And port 5001. Does that ring any bells? 5001? IPERF. All right, so some things jump out right away, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. SIN, MSS, Windows Scale, SAC, same. Round trip time is 166 microseconds, so we're all right. So uh, this, to me, looks like iPerf2 because it generally sends a little 24-byte packet, uh, TCP data, to start before it kicks off the transfer. Um, iPerf3 has like a separate TCP connection that does the control stuff and then kicks off a second connection. Um, so what do you, so that's expected, right? We send 24 bytes with a sequence number of one with a next expected sequence number of 25. So here it is, a packet with the next, or the sequence number is 25. What jumps out at you about this packet? Mm. Jumbo frame, 8,948 bytes. Is that legit? Is that offloading? You guys know about offloading where to break the data into MSS size chunks, some NICs will do it for you as a performance boost. But where we capture this is above the NIC, right? So we don't see that happen. So sometimes you see large packets of 8,000, sometimes, you know, 24,000 bytes packet, but that gets segmented on the wire. Well, let's go back to the free handshake. What's our MSS? All right. Okay, we'll call it a jumbo frame. And then we have an ACK. Is it ACKing the jumbo frame? No, ACK is 25. It's saying I've received all the data from zero to 24, one to 24, and the next thing I expect is, is 25. So it's ACKing that first little small 24 byte packet. It has not acknowledged this one yet. And then we send a second one and you know, we're in slow start, right? So we can't send too many packets before we have to wait for the acknowledgments. So we send a couple, we're gonna wait. Waiting, waiting until, let's see. I'm gonna set the time here until around 200 milliseconds. Well, actually, let me set it from here. This is the first one we, uh, this is where we sent the, the packet the first time. Right? Sequence number 25. So after 200 milliseconds, we send sequence number 25 again with the same amount of data. And we wait for the ACK. Don't see any ACKs. So we wait 600 milliseconds, 
and then 1.4, and then 3. What is that? What is that called? RTO. RTO. Back off. Right? We, we send something. We wait. Set a timer. When the timer expires, if we haven't received the acknowledgment, we're going to try again. So we keep doing that. We send it one time, two, three, four, five times we send it with no acknowledgment. When the back off happens, we're, we're, we're doubling the, the back off, right? 1.4 to 3 to 6, pretty, pretty close. What's different about this one? It's only 512. But what's the next packet? An ACK, 537. We sent, we're at sequence number 25. We sent 512 bytes of data. So that means the next sequence number is 537. And we have an ACK of 537. So it got through. And it got acknowledged. So we send another one. And it gets acknowledged. And if you look, we start sending these 512 size payloads, and they're, they're getting acknowledged, they're getting through. So we come down here, and then it seems to clear up. So all that initial data, is, I think we sent two jumbo size frames. So to clear all that, get all that data through, we broke it up into smaller bits, and then we, we get kind of caught up at this point right here, back to where we were. So it's all nice and clean. And how long did that take? Oh. Didn't they say it was like six to seven seconds of pause in the beginning? And it increases the TCP length, and those are getting through. Right? So what, 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 what issue is that? MTU. So why didn't, let's see, is there, is there, is there a DF bit set? There is, so we can't fragment it. So why didn't, what should have, what maybe could have happened here to fix this with MTU issues? Path MTU discovery? So we would expect to see what come back to us. ICMP, why don't we see that? I hear. Firewall could be. Firewall, block it. Uh, no IP unreachables. That's not it. What do you have to have to generate an ICMP? A router. Is there a router here? So what happens when you receive, let's say, switch port that doesn't have its MTU set correctly and you receive a jumbo frame on, you know, a jumbo frame on it. What's, what is that? Just an error, right? It's too big. Poof, gone. So I came back, said, hey, buddy, um, I'm so sorry you wasted a month of your life on this. This was like two minutes while I sipped some coffee. <laughs> um, you, got a, you got an MTU problem. You need to go through your, interf your, your config. And he never came back. Surprise. Okay, guys, um, we'll stop there. I appreciate your patience uh, or whatever. You know, the first thing uh, was fun, and I wanted to show it to you guys, but, you know, it's 35 minutes long. I'll have to come up with something. <laughs> Make it more cooler some way. Make, maybe do a, your, ooh, I like that. Maybe, yeah, maybe uh, some, some secret data transfer. Yeah, uh, if I do it again, I'll come up with something cooler. But anyway, I hope this was cool for you. Um, do, oh wait, let me go back to the, um, this here. You can find me, I'm going to talk packets, case studies, PCAPs, whatever. You can email me there, Twitter, uh, and that's my website where I do packet stuff. Uh, please fill out the survey in the app. And thank you for coming. Enjoy the last, what, there's only one more session, right? All right, it's almost over, you guys.